You're listening to episode number 14 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist, Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the show, everybody. Today, I have a very special guest, Patty Hinnich. She is the host of the PBS TV cooking series, Patty's Mexican Table. She's a mom of three boys. I don't know how she feeds them. And she's the author of Patty's Mexican Table and her newest cookbook, Mexican Today, New and Rediscovered Recipes for Contemporary Kitchens. I met Patty this past summer in Nantucket. She was there teaching cooking classes, and she was giving a talk that I went to about growing up in Mexico and her fondest food memories. I really loved Patty when I met her, and I was so excited when she says, sure, I'll be on your show. She's going to join us today to share her favorite guacamole recipe, her best tips for gathering her family around the table. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. And she's going to share a recipe from her new book for asparagus, mushroom, and goat cheese enchiladas with mole sauce. I'm actually making that recipe, and I didn't realize this, but there are thousands of different ways to make mole sauce. So cool. Anyway, I am giving away a copy of Patty's latest cookbook, so if you want to enter the giveaway, head on over to lizishealthytable.com slash podcast, and then just hop on over to the show notes page for episode 14, and within that blog post, I will give you instructions on how to enter the giveaway. Before we get started, as always, I need to thank my sponsors because without them, I would not be able to bring the show to you. I'd like to thank Zespri Sun Gold Kiwi Fruit. You know, if you're needing recipe inspiration, obviously you want to cruise around my website, but head on over to ZespriKiwi.com because they've got lots of terrific recipes using sun gold kiwis and green kiwis. So, check that website out. And also they have a Facebook page, Zespri Kiwi Fruit, so you can head on over and like them there. I'd also like to thank Bush's Beans. Beans, as you know, are versatile. They're nutritious. They're very prevalent in Mexican cooking. So we definitely want to give a shout out to bushbeans.com for sponsoring the show. And finally, I'd like to thank Super Healthy Kids. My online buddies, they have so many amazing recipes on their website. In fact, one of their most popular recipes ever is a baked potato with chili on top, speaking of Mexican cooking. So look for that over at superhealthykids.com. Well, I hope you're all hungry because the beautiful and nourishing cuisine of Mexico is about to be revealed. Patty, welcome to the show. Liz, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to have you on the show today, and I know we have a lot to talk about, but I want to talk about or start with the subject that is near and dear to my heart, which is children. I know you have three boys. I have two boys, and I'm so curious what it was like raising your three boys in the U.S. when you and your husband are from Mexico. You've got this Mexican kitchen. They're growing up in the U.S. So how'd you straddle the two? And, you know, are your boys now more likely to grab for a pizza or a taco? (laughs) This is such a wonderful question, and you asked it so beautifully. So it has been a great adventure. I'll tell you, both my husband and me were Mexican, and we both have three sisters. So we have families that are large and full of women. In my family, it was only girls. And now we're here in the U.S. and we have only boys. So not only is it different because I'm in the U.S., but also because I'm the only woman in a male-dominated household. And I love it. I love it. (laughs) In terms of the Mexican and American, it's been 
you know, a fabulous, ever-changing adventure. So it started with when my boys were little, me trying to keep them connected to Mexico and my way of feeling at home here in the U.S. and of growing roots and feeling like this was my home too, was to make the foods that I grew up with, that I loved and that had nurtured me. And so it was very funny because on any Friday night, I would be making the same thing for my boys that my sisters would be making for them their kids. So it's a way to stay connected. But at the same time, my boys were born in the U.S. My oldest was born in Texas and my two other boys were born here in Washington, D.C. And they're complete Mexican-Americans. I mean, when they were very little, didn't want to speak Spanish at home. They wanted to eat mac and cheese. They wanted to be just like their friends in school. So, you know, it's been a learning curve for me. And now they, of course, love Mexican food. And the more they grow, the more they're proud of their Mexican roots. But it's also been a humbling experience for me in learning the absolutely fabulous gastronomic, you know, history and wealth that exists in America that I didn't know much about. So... I think I do have a Mexican kitchen, but it's also very open to the American lifestyle. So we can be making carnitas tacos one night and then another night we'll have mac and cheese Mexicano, you know? So I think we're very open and accommodating and I love making Mexican food that's traditional, but I also love using Mexican ingredients and flavors in all kinds of food, American, Italian, Asian, which is also what happens in Mexico. In Mexico City, you'll go to a pizzeria and you'll dress it with pickled jalapenos and avocado. You'll go to, you know, a sushi restaurant and you will have the sushi pieces dunked in chiles toreados or fire roasted chilies dunked in soy sauce. So, It's this continuous, you know, evolution and learning and appreciating what has come before us, but also the things that we can play with. I love that. And I also love that you're from a family of three girls because I am the pickle in the middle of three girls and I have two boys and I always say I live in the house of testosterone and it (laughs) It's like I'm constantly feeding, feeding, feeding. So it's been an adventure in my household as well. So I'm curious before we dig deep into Mexican cooking, just you as a cookbook author and a television cooking show host, you're busy, you're in a, you know, running all over the place. I know you're going to Mexico City soon. How did you, when your boys were growing up, how did you manage to get everybody around the table for family meals? Because that's something I'm really passionate about. And I love to share ideas with moms and dads. But what was always your best secret? My best secret is make food that you absolutely adore because that is a magnet that attracts people Mm -hmm. (laughs) into the kitchen. And I find that as the boys have grown, I try to incorporate them into the kitchen and menu planning and even grocery shopping. And it's also a way for them to share with their friends. So you should see, you know, how proud they are when they They moved from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school and they make new friends and they want to have them over. They'll ask me, Ma, can we please make the carnitas? Mm -hmm. That's like they're, we're welcoming these people into our home. You know, in our home, food just means so much. And I think my hardest challenge or my toughest challenge has been Not getting my boys to seat for family time, dinner time, lunch time, breakfast, but my husband, because (laughs) he comes home from work really late. And so I remember being really frustrated when the boys were young and little because they had earlier times for going to bed. And I would really try to have him be here, you know, 6.30 or 7, which is the American time for dinner. And in Mexico, dinner is at 9 or 10 p.m. So we used to struggle a lot with that. But I think we've all gotten better. I've moved dinner to a later time now that the boys have, you know, they're older and then they can go to sleep later. And my husband, the more they grow, the more he realizes we don't have that much time with them at home. So he 
makes a much bigger effort to come home early. But just having great food that you love and giving the kids the choice to, I mean, not be picky and say, I don't want these or I don't want that, but to do suggest things that they'd like to try or to come to the store and choose some things that they want to bring home. I find that that really helps. And mostly inviting their friends over, you know, having the kitchen and cooking be something that your family is proud about. So their kids, hopefully, you know, aside from wanting to go to play to other kids' homes, they'll want to have people over to share what they have to share. Yeah, I love that tip. And I'd love for you to talk about Mexican food, kind of demystify it. Because, you know, when you think about the United States, we are a huge country. And Mm -hmm. the cuisine in California is different from the cuisine in Texas and different from New York City. So how would you even define Mexican cuisine? You know, demystify it for us. (laughs) Yes, I find that it is such a fascinating and wondrous topic. And The challenge in talking about it is that Mexican cuisine is always evolving, which is a fabulous thing, because I always say if a cuisine doesn't get updated and evolve and expand, it's bound to become stale, you know, and just lose its attractiveness. And I find that You have in Mexico the traditional Mexican food, which is a huge universe. You have different regional cuisines. You have the cuisine from the Yucatan Peninsula. You have the cuisines from Oaxaca, from Puebla. Now, all of the regional cuisines in Mexico have common denominators. All of the Mexican, you know, regional cuisines use corn masa. All of them have different kinds of chilies. And there's certain techniques that are used throughout, but there's a huge variety. And when you cross to the U.S., the fascinating thing nowadays is that no longer can we say that there's no real Mexican food in the U.S. There's a fabulous Mexican food in the U.S. And the fascinating thing is that there's regional Mexican you know, cuisines that are evolving north of the border that are just as authentic and just as delicious. So you may have, you know, a community or a family from Oaxaca that established themselves in Chicago. They open up a restaurant. They're doing Oaxacan food, but they're also learning to adapt their Oaxacan food to the ingredients that are regional and endemic to Chicago. So you start getting new twists and spins and new dishes that are being made by Mexicans or Mexican descendants or people that are trained by those Oaxacan Mexican cooks. And so it's just ever expanding, ever evolving, which in my mind is nothing short of beautiful. So if you're a home cook and you want to make mac and cheese and give it a Mexican twist, I will say when I was looking through Mexican Today, your gorgeous Mm -hmm. cookbook, the Mm -hmm. photo of your Mexican mac and cheese was like, oh my gosh, I have to make it. (laughs) So tell everybody a little bit about your version of mac and cheese, because you mentioned it earlier. Yeah, so that's the funny thing, Liz. In Mexico... I grew up in a very Mexican family, in a very Mexican household, eating very Mexican food. But when people think that Mexican food is only tacos, they haven't gotten enough information. In Mexico, we eat a lot of rice, we eat a lot of pasta. It's embedded and entrenched in our cuisine. So we also have different kinds of pastas. And we don't, for example, the mac and cheese mexicano that I have in my book, it's a version of a pasta that I grew up eating at home and that my mom grew up eating in her home. So it's like a mac and cheese version that instead of using the cheese bechamel sauce, it flavors it with poblano chilies or with any other fresh chili. And so it makes it fragrant and exotic and rich. And it's just not something new. So for example, 
Mexican pizza. I have a couple of Mexican pizzas in my cookbook. And again, pizzas in Mexico have existed for over a century. And Mexicans have been able to give pizza a Mexican spin. So if you want to make Mexican food at home, of course, you can look for recipes that are traditional Mexican recipes like chicken tinga or carnitas or barbacoa. But then if you decide that you want to make a pasta and spice it up with a Mexican chili or dress it up with some Mexican herbs, it's no heresy. Mexicans <laughs> do the same thing. I love this. I love this. I'm totally going to try to make that one. And I'm also loving your guacamole. You know, guacamole, I think, is one of those gateway foods for people. You know, they might say, I don't know if I like Mexican food. Well, you eat guacamole. And so how do you make your guacamole? What's your family's favorite version of guacamole? <laughs> so I tend to say that Mexico is divided between the people that like guacamole with lime juice and the people that like guacamole without lime juice. And the same thing can be said about tomatoes. I am one that likes guacamole with ripe avocado and a generous amount of lime juice because I think that avocado and lime juice just go hand in hand. They enhance each other. The lime juice helps the avocado stay green and beautiful and fresh and it brightens its taste. And I'm not such a fan of just throwing a diced tomato into the guacamole. I think if not prepared with a purpose, it <laughs> just waters it down. I have some guacamole versions that have roasted baby tomatoes or some guacamole versions that have diced tomato that's seeded, but it depends on what you're adding on the guacamole. But my favorite go-to guacamole has nothing but ripe avocado, lime juice, a fresh chili, a little bit of onion and cilantro, and a generous amount of salt. And I love it that way. You are a girl after my own heart because I also add lime juice to my guacamole. Mm -hmm. And I love, love, love cilantro. But you know, there are people out there, it's very polarizing. Yes. Who don't like cilantro. So do you have a recommendation for a substitution for people? Absolutely. And, you know, in Mexico, there's also people that don't like cilantro and it's not obligatory. You can totally skip the cilantro. What you want to add, if you want to add, is an herb of your choice. You just want to add a splash of herby flavor. So it can be some chopped chives. It can be some chopped parsley. It can be some chopped epazote. Or you can just skip the herb as well. It's good to give people options because I think, I know this is your goal, you really want to demystify Mexican cooking, you want to make it accessible, and I know that's what you do on your PBS TV show, Patty's Mexican Table. So you're in season six. Mm -hmm. What's your goal with the show? I mean, how do you structure it? You know, we think Mexico, it's huge, there's all these different regions. So how do you make that show accessible to people? Uh, I know there's just so much content. I always say that I just wish for many more years, you know, to be alive so that I can do more and more. Because even if I lived another hundred years, there wouldn't be enough time to cover what's going on with Mexican food and Mexican places. So I try to tackle one specific region per season. So this season, season six, we went to Oaxaca, which is incredibly rich and diverse and complex. And the season before, season five, we went to the Yucatan Peninsula, the season before, we went to San Miguel de Allende. The season before, we went to Michoacán. And what I try to do is to open up a window into a specific region of Mexico and connect with the stories, with the people, with the culture. And then when I come back to my kitchen, I try to make recipes that are really, really accessible for people to have a taste of the flavors of that region and to see just how easy it is to enrich your menus at home because Mexican cooking is incredibly accessible and easy and 
the fascinating thing, Liz, is, you know, I went to Michoacan five years ago and we did a season there. I could go back to Michoacan now and do another 13 episodes because there's new restaurants, there's more producers, there's more stories, there's so many things I didn't get to cover. And I mean, not only Mexico, but there's so much to feature of Mexicans that live here in America. There's such fabulous stories. And, you know, you talk about Mexican food evolving, and I really think of every country, every culture, and their cuisine evolving. Even if you think about the food in the U.S., when I was growing up as a kid, it was very simple, very basic. And now there's just like this world of flavors, world of ingredients, and then more people moving here from different cultures. So it's ever-changing, it's ever-evolving. But when we go back to our roots, our personal roots, I met you, Patty, this summer on Nantucket. You were out there doing cooking classes, and you spoke at the temple out there. You spoke about growing up Jewish in Mexico, your grandparents mm-hmm. coming over from Europe, how did they assimilate into Mexico and change their cuisine? I mean, I know I grew up, my grandparents, it was, you know, matzo ball soup. It was very, you know, traditional Jewish, well, Jewish American cuisine as it evolved. But how did your Jewish roots influence your cooking or how does it still influence your cooking? Hmm. That is actually a great topic because my grandparents were refugees from the Second World War on my mother's side and from the Polish programs on my father's side. And they were able to adapt the food that they brought from their home country. You know, in my Polish side, it was the Ashkenazi, very simple Yiddish foods, peasant foods. And on my mother's side, it was the Austro-Hungarian, very sophisticated cuisine. And they just enriched the dishes and the food that they knew with the Mexican ingredients and flavors. So I actually learned a lot from my grandmothers as to how to build bridges between the place where your family comes from and the place where you settle. So now that I settled in the U.S., we've been here for 20 years. You know, originally my husband and I were going to come for just a couple of years, but then he got a job offer and then I switched careers and then we ended up staying. And I find that I do that all the time in my kitchen, bridging my Jewish side with my Mexican side, with my American side, mostly from my children who were born here. And I see that the kitchen is this beautiful, open, noble space where you can really have the different parts of you interacting and reach each other. And I see the same thing happening with Mexicans here in the U.S. You know, they bring the dishes, the ingredients, the things they grew up with. And then, you know, they connect with the new ingredients that they find in the place where they settle. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. Mm -hmm. And our cuisine, our cooking at home was really great. My mom was a home ec teacher. The cooking was very basic, but delicious, simple ingredients. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we did not grow up with was spicy food. My mother does not like spicy food. But I would can imagine if she actually grew up in Mexico, she'd like it because she'd be used to it. Tell me about something as simple as, you know, chicken soup. How would your grandmothers have taken chicken soup and adapted that to the ingredients in Mexico? How would they have spiced it up? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, my grandparents on my mother's side, my grandmother was from Austria and my grandfather was from then Czechoslovakia when Czechoslovakia existed as one country. And, you know, they grew up with paprikash and with goulash. So they had an idea of the flavor and the richness of peppers. But my grandfather was obsessed with Mexican chilies, with jalapenos, like especially pickled jalapenos and chipotles and chipotles in adobo sauce and any kind of salsa. And when they first moved to Mexico and they started integrating, you know, the spices and the Mexican chocolate and vanilla and cinnamon into the pastries and all of that, my grandmother 
didn't know if jalapenos, I mean, in chilies, jalapenos, chipotles, if all of these Mexican peppers, if you ate them in large quantities, if they were bad for you. <laughs> so she just didn't know. So she used to limit my grandfather so much on the amount of chilies he would eat. So he would hide the jalapenos in his <laughs> pocket. And when my grandmother looked away, he would eat and then take a bite of the jalapeno in his pocket. It's very funny. And I only wish they had known, they both passed away, how healthy spicy peppers and Mexican peppers and chilies are. I mean, not only do chilies have a ton of vitamins and they unlock nutrients in your body, but they're also fabulous for speeding up metabolism and for digestion. It's just that she didn't know. So there was this soup she used to make. It was a matzoball soup and it's actually in my second cookbook in Mexican today. She used to make the most beautiful matzo balls, fluffy and elegant, and she used to season them with a little bit of grated nutmeg, which is so subtle, and a little bit of parsley. And I've added sesame oil to that, and I think she would have loved it because it makes the matzo balls just toasty, toasty tasting. (laughs) And then she used to sit her chicken broth on a bed of steamed mushrooms with a little bit of jalapeno and cilantro and onion. And my grandfather used to love that soup. So, you know, think about a matable soup that's rich and tasty and that has these really rich and powerful layer because mushrooms are intense, you know, and then they're flavored with the jalapeno. He used to adore these. And I put that soup in my cookbook And in his honor, I've added many more jalapenos, as many (laughs) as I think he would have loved in there. But my other grandmother, my bobe on my father's side, she used to make the typical Ashkenazi, you know, Yiddish Jewish foods. She made simis and she made the potato kugels. And when we would go to her house for Shabbat on Friday, she would have challah and a stack of warm corn tortillas. And she would have egg salad mixed with avocado. And then you would top either your challah or your warm corn tortilla with some of that avocado egg salad mixture. And then we top it with grievances. You know, instead of chicharrón with pork rind, she would make the grievances, which is the fried chicken skin that's very Ashkenazi Yiddish with a lot of onion. So, you know, it was their way of adapting. I love the idea of adding avocado to egg salad. I mean, that's super trendy now. Everybody loves avocado. They add it to everything. Mm -hmm. So I love that adaptation. Absolutely right up my alley. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, avocados, you mentioned chili being nutritious. Avocados are super nutritious. And would you say overall then Mexican food, you know, is Mexican food nutritious? Because it does have this reputation as being really heavy in cheese and fried this and that. You know, that's sort of the early American style Mexican. Yes. When you think of Mexican, do you think nutrition, fruits and veggies? Absolutely. And that is the one thing that I love is showing and breaking down stereotypes about because the Mexican food that I grew up with and most Mexicans grow up with is really healthy and nutritious. And there's unfortunately some versions or adaptations of Mexican food that, you know, spread like wildfire in the U.S. many years ago. But I think more and more increasingly people are finding out that Mexican food is based in a lot of vegetables and fruits and grains and beans. And I mean, I would dare to say that most of the Mexican food of most of the country in the Republic, not in Mexico City, but in the provinces, is vegetarian. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of beans, a lot of grains, a lot of vegetables. Love that. Love that. So I'm going to this dinner party on Saturday night. And I Mm -hmm. told my friend, because it's at her house, I said, okay, I'm going to bring a main dish from Patty's book, Mexican Today. And a reminder, if you're just tuning in halfway through the show, although I hope you've been listening since the top of the show, we are giving away a copy of Patty's book. But I'm going to make your asparagus, mushroom, and goat cheese enchiladas with pine nut mole sauce. And that's a mouthful. Can you tell everybody what is mole sauce? And then what I'll do is I'll make the recipe. And if it's okay with you, I'll post it 
to the blog so everybody can give that a try. Absolutely, Liz. So in my new book, you know how everybody now has Taco Tuesday and hashtag (laughs) Taco Tuesday and everybody goes out for tacos and makes tacos at home. So in this new book, I wanted to open up some new dishes to the mainstream and say, you know, you have Taco Tuesday, you can have Enchilada Wednesday. Enchilada is another category of Mexican cooking where you have corn tortillas that have no fat and they're made with nixtamalized corn, which is very nutritious. And it's just dressing these tortillas. You stuff them with different kinds of fillings and then you dress them with a sauce and you garnish them and they're a festive feeling meal. So in my chapter of enchiladas, I have some traditional, very famous enchiladas like chicken enchiladas in salsa verde or enchiladas placeras and then I added some new enchiladas like the one you're mentioning uh, that's stuffed with mushrooms and asparagus and then it's dressed with a luscious pine nut mole sauce. Mole is just a Nahuatl or you know ancient Mexican for saying something that's ground into a paste. To have a mole sauce, everybody knows I think the sweet mole that's seasoned with Mexican chocolate, yes, that's just yeah. one kind of mole sauce. There's hundreds of mole sauces. And to have a mole sauce, you need to have one kind of chili or another, but then you also need a combination of ingredients that are transformed before being added to the sauce. So for example, if you have tomatoes, onion, garlic, those may be roasted before being pureed or they may be boiled before being pureed. And then you have, you know, a few spices that start layering the flavor profile of the sauce and that makes it a mole. Think of Indian curries. I think it's a similar concept. So that's what mole is for Mexicans. See, and I am so naive because I always thought mole sauce was made with this Mexican chocolate. I had no idea. That sauce, the mole poblano, and there's also the mole negro in Oaxaca, those are just a few options for mole sauces. There's thousands, I mean thousands of mole sauces because every little town has their own way of making. There's mole verde, there's amarillito, there's coloradito, there's red, there's black. I mean, there's all kinds of moles. I have so much to learn, Patty. And I also have a lot to learn about chilies because I know this recipe I'm going to make calls for ancho chilies. But another recipe that I think I'm really going to overachieve, I want to also make your meatballs in, oh gosh, say it now, guajillo. Guajillo. Okay, so <laughs> yes. Meatballs in guajillo sauce, guajillo sauce with zucchini. And that calls for guajillo chilies. And and those are the delicious leaves. We just had those for dinner last night. That's so funny. So that's the fascinating thing about Mexican cuisine. I think when people unlock the doors of Mexican cuisine, they find that they have hundreds of tools to enrich their menus. What you were saying about the chilies. You have ancho chiles, you have guajillo chilies, and you have dozens of other chilies. They're dried chilies that will keep in your pantry for months and they all have a very different flavor profile so for example the ancho chile is a little bit chocolatey so the ancho chile is the fresh poblano chili that has been basked in the sun for days and left to dehydrate and the flavors concentrate and it becomes chocolatey a little bit prune like it's a little bit bittersweet it's not spicy at all And then you have the guajillo chile, which is a totally different chile that's not spicy either. And I like to describe it as a peppy, crowd-pleasing chili. It just has, it's a little bit similar to paprika, but much richer. And so you have all these different kinds of chilies. And I tell people, you know, try a dish with a new chile so you can get to know that chile. And then you can bring that chile into other dishes. But I know you will recognize how different the flavor is and how colorful your kitchen can be if you start using these ingredients. So you talk about these guajillo chilies and you say they're mild, peppy, and happy. So I know Mm -hmm. that's a chili I'm going to love. But what if I can't find that in the supermarket or is it going to be easy to find? 
So I think that Guajillo chilies, the basic dried chilies of Mexico, which are Guajillo, Ancho, Chile de Arbol, you can find them in most grocery stores today. You don't have to go to Latino or Mexican little stores anymore. Most of the mainstream grocery stores have a Latino or Mexican aisle. Or if you go to your grocer and just say, I really want to get this ingredient, they just need to hear from their customers. But you can always find them online here in the U.S. in stores that sell here to online. Now, if you can't find guajillo chilies, I always love giving substitutions when there are. So if you can't find guajillo chilies, you can use New Mexico. You can use, you know, hot chilies or New Mexico style dried chilies. And the flavor profile is very similar. Good to know. All right. Well, I'll be on the lookout mm -hmm. and I'm going to be hanging out in my kitchen on Saturday. I'll send you some love on Instagram or Twitter. Just see wherever in the world you are. I think you're going to Mexico City. You'll be able to <laughs> see Liz's home cooking. So I know you're going to Mexico City. Can you just tell everybody how things are going down there? Because, you know, with the earthquake, is there a, you know, a place where a way people can get involved or help out? What's the status? What's going on? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we had these couple of earthquakes that were devastating. And I was actually in Mexico City on September 19th when this huge earthquake took place. And it was the anniversary of an earthquake that took place in 1985 when I was a really young girl, also in Mexico City. And it was devastating. There was a lot of damage, but the whole city and the whole country has come together and everybody that I know is involved in efforts to rebuild and to support people in need. So I think it's going to take, you know, a little bit of time for everything to get back to where it was. Some buildings need to be rebuilt, but Mexicans are resilient and really hardworking and optimistic and everybody's, you know, working and trying to make things happen. Good to know. Good to mm -hmm. know. You know, there's just been so much, you know, between earthquakes and hurricanes and fires. It's been a crazy few months. And I know one of the ways that we can help each other is through food. And, you know, down in Puerto Rico, Jose Andres is doing a lot with cooking for people in need. And it's just amazing how food. I know he's doing such an amazing job. And I think it takes people like him and other people, you know, each one of us from a little corner saying, what can we do? How can we help? So, you know, I have these events that we do at the Mexican Cultural Institute. And we had the very last one last Thursday and we turned it into a fundraiser for Oaxaca and we got so much support and I contacted an organization that supports traditional cooks in Oaxaca and we made a list of the tools that they need because most of them lost their homes and their kitchens in Juchitan in the Tehuantepec Ismus. and we're gonna go and buy stoves and comales and pots and pans because you know, we thought that this is the best way to give these Mexican cooks the means to keep on working so that they can help with the local economy and try to rebuild their lives. So I think every effort is welcome. Good to know. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. And I just have a few more questions because on the show, I always like to ask my guests about their favorite cookbook, something that's on their shelf. Obviously, <laughs> I know you love your own cookbooks, but a book that's on your shelf that you find yourself turning to time and time again. What is it? <laughs> that's a great question. So I always turn to Jack Pepin and Dory Greenspan and Lydia Bastianich. I love her cookbooks. And in a garden, you know, I started cooking with the Barefoot Contessa when I just got married and moved to the U.S. That's, I think, was one of the first cookbooks that I got. So I love those. And in terms of desserts, Dory Greenspan and I have that wonderful desserts book by Maida Heaters, which is absolutely fabulous. You have a lot of books on your shelf, I can tell. <laughs> oh my gosh, so many. I'm obsessed with cookbooks, especially anything that has to do with Mexican food. Yeah. I'm kind of with you on that. The chef that I'm obsessed with is Yotam Otto Lange out of, yes. uh, out of London. And he's out with a new book called Sweet. And I think he's using lots of interesting spices in some of his desserts. I don't have the book yet, but I'm going to get a hold of that one pretty soon. 
Yes, he's so fabulous. We were just in London a couple of months ago and we had brunch at Nopi mm -hmm. and it was so delicious. Yeah, I had lunch at Nopi and I would agree it's super interesting. And, you know, that's the whole thing about cuisine. You know, I've met Joan Nathan and, on Nantucket this summer. I'm yeah. sure you know Joan Nathan. And it's just so fascinating when you think about cuisine, how so much of it really originated in India, in China, in the Middle East, and just has kind of worked its way around the world. And I agree. And Joe Nathan is one of the people that I really, really look up to. We're really close friends. And I have all of her cookbooks and all of her recipes work and are fabulous. And her research that she does for every recipe is so beautiful and outstanding. I have to agree with you on that. Yes, she she's got a lot of knowledge in that head of hers. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> yes. Is there a chef or a cookbook author out there, somebody that you really admire that you've never met that you would love to meet? I've never met Lydia. Oh, no, wait, I did meet Lydia for a few seconds at the <laughs> APT fair a few years ago, but I would love to have the chance to sit with her and chat. I really like her work. I really like her approach. I love how her recipes always give you different versions and adaptations um, while staying true to the roots. Um, yeah, I really like what she does. Mm -hmm. It is good to have adaptations to recipes because a lot of people think you have to make a recipe as is, and they don't realize that you can play with it, you can adapt it, you can change it. And it's really just starts out kind of as your canvas. I really do try to, like, if I'm going to make your recipes, I will follow them to the T the first time. Right. And then I might say, hmm, I might add such and such next time. Yeah. Then you can start to play. And I think for people that write cookbooks and, you know, write about food, um, like what you do too, it's, I mean, I find it so flattering and I feel so proud when somebody takes one of my recipes and they make it their own and incorporate it into their weekly staples. I don't care if they change them, transform them, you know, but the fact that you were able to give someone an idea, even if it's just a little seed and you helped with a night riddle, you know, what to make for dinner, I think then our job is done. I would agree. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to share, Patty, before I wrap up today's show? Ah, well, no, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. And I hope we connect on social media and to your listeners that like Mexican food. I hope you all tune in to my show on your PBS station and connect with me on social media. I'm Patty Hinich everywhere. So, and what's your website, just so everybody knows? So it's P-A-T-I-J-I-N-I-C-H, so pattyhinich.com, and I also use Patty Hinich for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, everything. So we would pronounce your name Patty Hinich and not Patty Jinich with the J. Well, in Mexico, we say Hinich, but here most people say Jinich. And you're going to give us a buy on that one, right? You're just going to say, yeah, Absolutely. It's, okay. <laughs> it's totally fine. Good to know. Well, Patty Hinich, thank you so much for joining us today. Liz, thank you so much for having me on. I look forward to meeting you again. So that's all we have on the show today. I hope you'll stop by LizIsHealthyTable.com slash podcast to enter the giveaway for Patty's amazingly gorgeous, fabulous cookbook. I welcome you to follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. And if you love the show, please stop by iTunes and post a review. Tell all your friends about the show because the more, the merrier. And until next time, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table. 